Before I begin this morning, I want to just share a few reminders. Uh, the first one is in your bulletin, and it is our prayer for our schools. I want to invite you to be a part of that on Sunday, September 23rd, uh, beginning at 415 at the elementary school. There's a schedule in the bulletin if you can only come for your child or grandchild's school that you can follow. But I really want to invite us as a church to pray for our schools and to pray for those that attend there as students as well as for the staff and the administration. So I want to invite all of you. If you're a small group leader, you should have got an email from me inviting you to invite your small groups to participate in that. But I want to invite the entire congregation to be a part of our prayer for our schools on uh, September 23rd. I'm going to be in Ephesians 1, uh, verses 7 to 10 this morning, um, so you can go ahead and turn there. If you need a Bible, there's a blue Bible in the row in front of you. We're on page 946 in that Bible. Also want to uh, bring your attention to the front of the bulletin. There is a notes page where you can take some notes, as well as my blog address where I'll post the notes later this afternoon, my Twitter name and cell phone number for you to ask questions or make comments based on the message. So in greeting time this morning, I had you share where you are from. And so what I want you to do just for a minute, or a few seconds, with the person beside you right now, is answer this question. Why do we ask that when we meet somebody? Why do we ask somebody, where are you from? So talk with the person beside you for about 10 seconds, and then we'll continue on. So I don't know what you're talking about, but I think the answer to that is we think that when we know where somebody is from, that helps us know who that person is. So I have a map up here, and I know this is not the scale. So on the bottom left is Colorado, and then above is Kansas really zoomed in. And there are four of the five places that I have lived. So. I am originally from Yates Center, Kansas, which is in southeast Kansas. Then I went to Sterling College, so that's, so Yates Center's in the middle of the Kansas one, and then you go uh, to Sterling uh, on the left. And then after Sterling College, uh, Bethany and I got married, and we moved to Denver for me to go to Denver Seminary. So Denver, uh, spent some time there. Three of our four kids were born there. And then after Denver, we went back to Iola, Kansas, which is in southeast Kansas, before we came to Heston, Kansas. So why do I share all of those locations with you? Because each of those places have shaped who I am. So something about each of those places has made JL who I am today. And I think you would probably say the same thing, that the places that you have lived might be positive, might be negative, but they've shaped you and they've made who you who you are. And so this morning I've titled my message, Live From, Not For. And this is based on a quote that I often share with my kids and I've shared with many others, and this is the quote, Live from your identity in Christ, not for it today. So we're going to look at what it means to live from not for this morning. But before I read our, the passage this morning, just uh, some quick background. So this is written by Paul, and it is written to the church in Ephesus. And one of the things that is very interesting as you look at all of Paul's letters is how they are put together. Have you ever thought about that? Like, Paul had a reason for chapter 1 being chapter 1 and chapter 6 being chapter 6. There's a, there's a flow there, and all of Paul's letters seem to flow like this. And what I mean is, before Paul tells us what we should do as followers, he reminds us who we are. So Ephesians 1 through 3 all talk about our position in Christ. It's telling you who you are. This is what is true about you because you are in Christ. And then chapters 4 through 6 
talk about what that looks like in practice for those who are in Christ. So you'll look at the church, you'll look at marriage, you'll look at spiritual warfare, but all of that has to be read in light of who we are. And so Paul, in this chapter 1 specifically, he wants you to know who you are in Christ no matter what you think about yourself, no matter what other people think about you, and what the world tells you. Paul wants the Ephesians and us to know who we are because he knows it will impact what we do. So I'm going to read uh, Ephesians 1, verses 7 to 10, just a quick FYI for you. Verses 3 to 14 in the Greek is one sentence. Okay? So look at that in your Bible. 3 to 14 is one sentence. So we need to, I'm going to just read a part of that, but there's something that went before it, and there's something that comes after it. And this was so important that Paul made it one sentence. So we need to remember that as we go. But follow along with me as I start in verse 7, but I encourage you to go back and read all of it together. <clears throat> in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. And he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment, to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. So I have three points this morning. The first one is union, verses 7 and 8a. Verse 7 is a very simple phrase, in him. Paul never uses the word Christian in his writings. However, Paul uses the phrase in Christ, in him, or a related phrase like that, 160 times. In that really long sentence in Ephesians 1, he uses the phrase 11 times. In verses 3 to 14, 11 times you will see in him, in Christ, or a related phrase. To us in the English language, in him would be very easy to skip over. But I want to encourage you that when you see the words in him, in Christ, in your Bibles, I want you to underline them. And I want you to see that there's some power and some amazing truth in the simple phrase, in him. And you've heard me, as I've stood up here and preached before, that if something's repeated, it's probably important. And so 11 times he says, in him or in Christ. What does he want you to know? He wants you to know that you are united with Christ. You have union with Christ. And that phrase might be, you might not understand what that phrase means. Um, it's, it's a phrase that I have learned and grown a lot in over the last uh, few months. In the class that I teach, last year we spent half a year talking about union with Christ. And I would encourage you to really think about what does that mean for me? And so the author of the book, Rankin Wilborn, he says, union with Christ means that you are in Christ and Christ is in you. What in the world does that mean? Well, it means that when God looks at you, he sees Jesus. It means you are fully acceptable and pleasing to God because of what Jesus has done. And I could go on and on and tell you about all the things that are true about you because you are in Christ. But I would encourage you to pick up the book, Union with Christ by Rank and Wilburn, to read more about that. What about Christ in you? It's not you pull yourself up by your bootstraps and get busy. You have Christ himself 
living in and through you, empowering you, Christ in you, the hope of glory. This is good news, that we are united to Christ. And it's not just you are in Christ, but it's also that Christ is in you. So I would encourage you to think about that. So what would it look like for you to live from your union, not for it? So you're not busy trying to get this union. It's already yours in Christ. So live from your union. The next phrase there is the word, uh, the word is redemption. Redemption's not a word we talk about a lot in, in the English language, but it's, the idea would have been very well understood for Paul and his readers. It's one, an image of deliverance by payment of a ransom to free slaves or prisoners. So if someone was a slave or a prisoner, redemption could happen if a payment was made. And then that person is free. And so in our verse today, we find what that price was. And that price of redemption for us was the blood of Christ. It's very appropriate that we are going to be celebrating communion uh, this morning. Redemption looks back to Calvary. But it also looks forward to the freedom in which the redeemed stand. We are redeemed from our former way of life. Your past and your sins no longer define you because you have redemption and Jesus paid the price with his blood. Redemption is the foundation of God's work on behalf of humanity. One of the commentators said this, without redemption, nothing else could be done. Without redemption, nothing else could be done. This whole Christian life, if we don't have redemption, nothing else matters. This redemption means we have a new standing with our creator. And this new standing is not based on our worthiness, but simply according to the wealth of his grace. Redemption is a privilege that you have and enjoy right now. It's not something that's later. You have it right now. And this little verse, verse 7, these ideas of ransom and sacrifice and substitution are brought together. Those were some things I preached on this summer. I preached on Jesus as our sacrifice, our Savior, and our substitute. Verse 7 talks about all of those packed in a few short words. So what does it mean for you to live from your redemption, not for it? You're not trying to earn this redemption. It is yours in Christ. He goes on. He talks about forgiveness. Through Christ's death, you are forgiven. Your past, present, and future sins, all of them, are forgiven because of what Jesus has done on the cross. All of us in this room have sinned, including the preacher. Every one of us has sinned, and we need forgiveness. And Christ provides us with that forgiveness. The word here for forgiveness comes from a Greek word, aphasis, and it actually comes from a verb that means to send away. And so one of the commentators mentioned it should immediately, as you see this word, and we don't see it because forgiveness means something to us, but those that read it and understood where it came from immediately would have thought about Psalm 103, verse 12. If you remember, I preached on that this summer. And that verse says, As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed or sent away our transgressions or sins from us. 
And if you remember, if you were here that week, I talked about there's a reason it doesn't say north and south. North and south has a measurement to it. But east and west indicates something that cannot be measured. So you will never catch up to your sin, and your sin will never catch up to you. That's good news for us. And this idea of forgiveness of sin, I feel like we talk, there's so many things we talk about so much in the church, and we lose what they're saying. But think about forgiveness of sin for a minute. That means that the sins that you are going to do later today, tomorrow, next week, sins in your past, none of those sins are put on you. None of them. They're put on Jesus on the cross. That is, I don't think we get that. That, that should cause us to be excited because you're not paying for your sins. Somebody else did. And that's really good news. And not only that, but forgiveness of sin means that you're freed from the chains of the devil and of death. Because of sin, you deserve death. But Jesus took the punishment and the wrath and the judgment that you and I deserve because of our sin upon himself on the cross. And so you're free. That's what forgiveness means. You don't need to keep bringing those sins back up. When, when Satan starts bringing that sin back up to you, you go, yes, I did that, but Jesus paid for that. That's, that's what we got to do. We don't deny our sin. We say, yes, I am a sinner, but thankfully Jesus paid for that. So Satan, you go deal with him. That's what forgiveness of sins mean. You should not be weighed down by your sin. When you're, sin, you're going to sin this week, I know I'm going to sin this week, and when we do it, don't wallow in it. Don't let it weigh you down. Run to Jesus. Run it to Jesus. Then in verse 8, it talks about being lavished with grace. It talks about the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. The definition of lavish is spending or giving with liberality or abundance. So I was thinking, what's something that's lavish? And the thing that I thought of most recently was the wedding of Meghan Markle and Prince Harry. That was pretty lavish. If you watched any of it, if you watched the events that went up to it, that's not your ordinary, average, let's just get by wedding. That was lavish. And so, do we think about God's grace towards us as lavishness? It's not just enough. It is abundant, and it is amazing. The word grace comes from the Greek word charis, and sometimes it's translated as grace, sometimes as favor, sometimes beauty, thankfulness, gratitude, delight, kindness, good turn, or benefit. Grace is something we receive, but we don't deserve it. Grace is something you receive, but you don't deserve it. Grace is entirely about what God in Christ, through the Spirit, gives to us without any merit or earning on our part. Grace, we receive grace because of who God is, not because of what we do. And if you spent any time with me, you know I love to talk about grace. And some people might be like, are you ever going to move on? No, I'm not. Um, so the message of grace is the message the world needs to hear. If the first word people out there, if the first, if you say, what is the church about? If they don't say grace, we have a message problem. It's what it's all about. It's what makes us different than any other religion, this idea of grace. But even though grace is a church word, do we even understand it? In church, 
we still use images and phrases to help us understand what grace is. And I think grace is all over in the scriptures. It's in the Old Testament. It's in the New Testament. But let's, let's just a minute think about the songs that we sing about grace. We say it's amazing. We say it's greater than all our sin. We sing your grace is enough. Jesus sought me when a stranger unfailing love that you would take my place that you would bear my cross you laid down your life that I would be set free Jesus I sing for all you've done for me your kindness makes me whole you're making me like you where Jesus bled and died for me. Just a sum. Probably you maybe heard some of those words this morning. You know, the, the planners, uh, they, they do some work to prepare for what we do here. There's, there's a reason that we sing the songs that we do, and there's truth in the words that we sing. So I'm never going to get tired of hearing or growing in my understanding of grace and talking about grace with others. And there was a man in history named John Calvin who felt the same way. Listen to this quote from him. Riches and the corresponding word overflow, talking about these verses in the following verse, are intended to give us large views of divine grace. The apostle feels himself unable to celebrate in a proper manner the goodness of God and desires that the contemplation, the thinking of it, would occupy the minds of men till they are entirely lost in admiration. How desirable is it that men were deeply impressed with the riches of that grace which is here commended? What a quote. Do you see what it says there? What would happen if Heston M.B. was lost in admiration about the grace of God? This world would be changed. That is how important grace is. So what does it mean to live from grace, not for it? We have to live from grace. And unfortunately, what I think we often do is we live from law, not grace. So what would happen if you and I would de dive deep into the meaning of the grace of God for us? and for the people around us. It would change everything. So that's my new prayer. This quote is going to be my new prayer for Heston M.B., that we, when we think we've understood grace, we go deeper. When we think, well, we're getting tired of talking about grace, nope, we're going to come back to it. We're going to keep talking about this because it's the thing that sets Christianity apart from all other things. We have got to talk about what God in Christ through the Holy Spirit, has done for us and not focus on what we do. We've got to understand that. So I've spent a lot of time on that word. Union is so important, and I just, I just looked at a few of those words. There's so much more I could talk about. The next U is understanding. In verse 8b and 9, this wisdom and understanding does not refer to our wisdom and understanding, but to God's divine understanding. God, from his wisdom and understanding, has chosen to reveal himself to his people, the plan. And do you know what the plan is? God redeeming, restoring, and reconciling the world to himself. And he has revealed that to us. Now, if you look in the verse there, it uses the word mystery. Now, to us, mystery means like eerie or something like that. 
In Paul's day, when he was writing that, the word mystery would have meant secretive or cult-like. But that's not the mystery we're talking about. The mystery that is being talked about here is the good news that Christ died for sinners, which included the Jew, and here's the mystery, and Gentile. That Christ died for sinners for the free, here's the mystery, and the slave. That Christ died for sinners, which included the male, but the female. And that Christ died for the sinners, which includes the rich, but it also includes the poor. This mystery was something that wasn't understood in the past, but now is being made known in Christ. The church was somewhat of a mystery to those in the Old Testament. They had the temple, but the church was a mystery. Jews and Gentiles worshiping together in one body, that was a mystery during the Old Testament. And it says why he did this. Look in verse, in verse 9. Why did he do this? For God's good pleasure. All that we do is for the glory of God. And then the last thing, the last uh, point is unity, verse 10. We talk a lot about when are we going to achieve unity in this world? When are we going to have unity in the United States? How is unity going to happen? Well, I don't know the answer to those questions, but I do know what the Bible says in verse 10. It says, this unity will happen when times have reached their fulfillment, which means at the end. Now, I'm not saying that unity is not important for us today. I'm not saying that we shouldn't seek unity in our homes, in our churches, in our world, but a complete unity is not going to come until the end of time. And so I have some more good news for you. Hopefully you've heard some good news this morning. I'm, like when Brad told me what verses I had, I was like, okay, that, that's going to be an easy one to preach because there's so much good news here. But here's some more. No matter what happens in your life, in this church, or in this world, Christ is the head of the church. No matter what happens, it's not... Christ is the head of the church, and one day every knee will bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus is the head. Jesus is Lord. And this unity is only going to be brought by Christ alone. And the goal of this unity is not just unity in itself. The goal is this anointed king named Jesus. And so this morning, we've looked at Ephesians 1. We've seen our union and our understanding and our unity from these verses. But I hope you saw something. Where was what you do in these verses? Nothing. Nothing. It is all Christ alone, grace alone, and then the part that we kind of contribute to is faith alone but it's really what is our faith in our faith is in jesus so all of this is by grace alone christ alone faith alone and so i'm going to invite the worship team uh, to come forward